as you can see behind me, my name is Helen McIntosh and I'm the president of the South East London Chamber of Commerce. I'm delighted to um, welcome everyone to the Autumn Property Group webinar. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of housekeeping. We're not going to have chat uh, working today, but what I will ask you to do at the end of the four presentations, if you are, ask questions as if we were in a real event. Um, and I'm going to ask you, I think everyone knows where to find the little yellow hand. So if you, when you wish to ask a question at the end, please raise your hand. Now I'm going to hand over now to Mita Kaur of Town and Legal LLP, who's going to be the first person to enlighten us in the property world. Over to you, Mita. Thanks, Helen, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, in a moment, I'm going to start today's session by setting the scene, so to speak, um, for this discussion about the future of the high street. And I'm going to do that by providing some details <clears throat> around some of the recent changes to planning legislation um, brought in by the government over the last year or so. They're all aimed at relaxing and providing flex in the planning system so you can do more on the high street. And they've all been firmly badged as aim, you know, at, at reviving our high streets, particularly um, in the face of COVID, uh, but also around other government commitments, main one being speeding up housing delivery. So specifically, I'm going to be looking at the changes to the use classes order um, and some, some of the new PD rights. And then I'm going to hand over to others to talk about the implications of those in more detail. So next slide, slide please. Uh, very quickly, a little bit about Town. I'm Mita Kaur. I'm a founding partner of Town Legal. Um, Town is a specialist planning law firm set up at the end of 2016 to provide advice on all things planning law. Uh, we all came from uh, city law firms originally, such as SJ Berwin, KWM, Herbert Smith, and we wanted to provide uh, and establish a centre of ex excellence for planning law advice. Um, there are now about 40 of us and we're based in the city of London and we work across London, but also across the rest of the country. So as I said, I'm going to dive straight in. I'm going to talk about changes to the use classes order uh, more generally, and then we're going to look around uh, look at some of the PD rights created um, around creating additional resi. Next slide, please. All right, the use class changes, the big shakeup. So um, in July uh, last year, the government made um, the use classes amendment um, regulations 2020. They came into force on the 1st of September and they shook up our familiar friend, um, the use classes order, in some pretty fundamental ways. And I think the most fundamental shake up that I've seen in my planning career. Um, and I've been a, plan, a, a, a chartered town planner and a local authority moving on to law um, latterly. Um, there are essentially changes throughout. Um, we've got some main changes set out on the on the slide there, class A, class B1, some of the class D uses are no more, they've been subsumed um, into this new super class, class E, commercial business and service use, which um, had everyone talking, getting very excited, plus we've got some new um, class F uses as well. Um, it's probably worthwhile just covering some basics um, because it seems to me that these changes along with the PD rights that we've had um, have led to a little bit of confusion about what each of them do. So changes within use classes do not constitute development, hence why class E was so exciting because it encompassed now a huge range of uses. You can flip flop between them um, and you do not, that doesn't constitute development. You don't need any kind of specific or deemed um, permission. Um, you have to begin with an actual, but not necessarily active lawful use um, before you can then have the benefit of those changes within a class. Uh, these new use classes, by the way, apply anywhere in England and class E changes can be part use. So this is recognizing the fact that the way we use places and spaces today often, often um, involves a number of different uses being co-located within the same space. Um, class F2 was essentially designed to protect, protect community uses uh, and it's probably also worth pointing out that we've got some new sui generis uses and remember you need planning permission to change to or from um, any sui generis use. If we just go to the next slide please. So here you've got a handy summary that shows you what the use classes order looked like until the 31st of August last year and what it looked like after from the 1st of September um, last year. 
and you can see there are class A's gone, B1's gone, D1, D2 subsumed or bits of subsumed into other new uses. Next slide, please. So what are some of the practical issues arising? Well, there were some transitional provisions. Um, it focused on a material period, or a lot of them did, that expired uh, relatively recently on the 31st of um, July. Basically what they, the transitional provisions essentially did to the extent that we had them, and uh, in my view, they weren't terribly complete or terribly clear. Um, it, you, it told you how you should deal with applications um, for prior approval, how you should deal with Article 4 directions, um, et cetera, how you should deal with PD rights. However, we now have got, uh, with the expiry of the, uh, of the transitional provisions, we've now got a new GPDA, which has been amended to take account of these new use classes. Um, as I said, Article 4 directions pre the 1st of September to be read in the same way, um, and so on. Now, what about un unimplemented permissions? What if you've got one? Um, so you, you've got no actual use until you actually implement. Um, so you might want to deal with that by way of a non-material amendment or Section 73 to amend your permission, or you simply implement um, one of the uses that is on the face of your existing permission, uh, where the uses are set out in old money and then you get the benefit of, of, of the new use classes and how you can change between uses in the new use classes from that point onwards. Worth noting, planning history may still be restrictive, so look at your conditions, look at your Section 106 obligations, because just because we've got the new use classes order uh, and we've gone you know, through this period of transitional provisions, it doesn't mean that those don't still bite on what you want to do. Next slide, please. So practical issues part two, these are perhaps a little bit more forward looking. Um, so issues to consider for new planning applications and permissions. What if you want to put in a new planning application on the basis of the new use classes? What do you have to consider? Well, your approach to assessment. Um, when you are you know, uh, compiling your various assessment reports on various issues that you're going to put in front of the local authority, if you are going for a class E use and you want the flexibility of all the uses within that class, then your approach to assessment has to be rather broader and rather more carefully considered than perhaps if you were going for something that was much more limited, such as class A1. You need to watch out for conditions because local authorities can still impose conditions that limit um, you to certain parts of, for example, class E. Um, and local plan policies, remember, they're all predicated at the moment on old money use classes, not new money use classes. And to the extent that a local authority feels that it needs to protect certain uses, and it has the local plan policy that says that that's what it can do, and that is an adopted policy, you can see that they will still be sticking with those. And the other point to, to watch out for is still where you might have old money use classes in your old charging, uh, use, uh, charging schedules. A couple of other points to note, planning permission still required for facilitating any external works that you might want to um, carry out in connection with your use class changes. Title I'm not going to deal with here because other people um, on this discussion can do that much better than me, but that's just another point to watch out for. And then I suppose the final point is that there is a legal challenge that was mounted to the new use classes amendments and, and not all of the new PD rights, but a lot of the new PD rights by rights community action. And that was rejected by the High Court, but it is due to be heard by the Court of Appeal next month. In fact, I think in less than a week. Um, so, you know, watch this space, although to be honest, um, even if it were to be successful, I think we can safely say that the government's committed to that sort of course of action. So it will come back around again, whatever happens. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, so um, moving on to permitted development rights. I think uh, it's safe to say that last year PD rights were rather like buses. Um, there was one coming along every five minutes, the government was basically um, knocking them out like there was no tomorrow. They've all got one thing in common, they're aimed at increasing housing supply and the speed of delivery. So um, since last year, there have been a number of permitted, uh, permanent permitted development rights, I should say, um, that are aimed at precisely this. And I'm going to deal with them in four rounds. <clears throat> and I should say as painlessly as I possibly can. Um, right, round one, uh, you can see there's our first piece of amending legislation. It introduced three main changes, but the one that we're going to focus on is the last 
bullet point there. So it's the new PD rights for construction of new homes on detached blocks of flats came in from the 1st of August, um, 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So what we got was a new part 20 class A to schedule to the GPDO. I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't um, knock out some of those sorts of um, uh, um, statistics and, and details. Um, basically, you can have up to two additional stories of new flats on the top of your existing block of flats. It permits additional works in, con in connection um, with those additional stories. I've set out there some of the main restrictions. And I do say the main restrictions because there are a lot and that is a common feature for all of these. Um, so you can see some of them there. You also have to apply for prior approval. Um, and that's quite an important issue. I'll come back to that again in a minute because it does apply across the board and is one of the issues of debate around these PD rights. There are various other conditions there as well. Again, this is not all of them. Um, it is some of them. So complete the development with three years of, um, within three years of the prior approval, um, submit a, a, um, a plan for management of construction of the development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to round two. This is the next piece of legislation. More upwards extensions into force 31st of August 2020. There were five new classes, but two of most interest here, and that's class AA and class AB. They both permit new dwellings on detached buildings in, um, in mixed use. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, if we just focus briefly on class AA. So new dwelling houses on detached buildings in commercial or mixed use, you can get up to two additional stories of flats on the top of your building, um, where that building is in any of these uses, um, or a mixture of the two or more of those uses, or housing together with one of those uses. Again, you get um, you get the benefit of additional works in construct in terms of um, well, whether in, in connection with the construction of those additional stories. Main restrictions again, like I say, once again, not all of them, but they're some of the main ones. It's not applicable to listed buildings or sites in conservation areas, etc. But that's one worth pointing out. And again, you've got to apply for prior approval. Next slide, please. Class AB, new dwelling houses on terrace buildings in commercial or mixed use. I don't think I need to dwell on those. Basically, it allows buildings in a terrace, um, definition of that, two or more attached buildings, um, to be subject to upward extension for new dwelling houses. It applies to buildings in the same uses as class AA above. Um, and you can get either one or two additional stories depending on your existing building. Other restrictions in terms of maximum height and again, prior approval and other requirements largely um, as, as for class AA. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what happened next? Uh, you guessed it, more, uh, more uh, legislation. Um, here, this one came into force on 31st of August 2020, Class ZA of Part 20 of Schedule 2. Now, this actually allows demolition of your existing building and construction of new dwelling houses in its place. There are various restrictions, prior approval as above, and other requirements. If we can move on to the next slide. There's a bit more detail about what it permits. So it permits de demolition and replacement. That existing building has to be within use class B1A to C or any combo existing on the 12th of March, 2020. And there I've set out some more of the restrictions. And as you can see, there are restrictions around that, you know, or requirements, I suppose, um, about that building having been vacant, um, footprint um, of the old building not being exceeded, that kind of thing. And again, our old friend, prior approval requirements. Next slide, please. And you'll be glad to know we are on the home stretch. Um, we are now in uh, round four. Um, this is uh, this is the only PD right at the moment, or um, as they've been brought in in this way, that was based on the new use classes. So this is the E to C3, or change of use from commercial business and service use to dwelling houses that came in on 21st of April 2021. New class MA in part three of Schedule 2. Um, some noteworthy restrictions. The building must have been in class E, including time in former uses, i.e. these old money uses, for two years and vacant um, for at least three months. It applies in conservation areas, that's useful. Prior approval is required. 
and there is a cap of 1500 square meters um, on the amount of floor, floor space that, that can be subject to this PD right. Now, in terms of the way that that cap is expressed, it's a little bit vague, so it could go beyond that. It's also worth pointing out that at the same time, really, that this has come in, what we've lost is the class A existing office to resi PDRs. And uh, another challenge, this time by Islington, it's yet to be heard by the High Court. And also, I think there are lots of local authorities that are making Article 4 directions to try and limit um, this PD right being available um, in their area. <clears throat> um, probably at this point, just worth coming back to this issue about prior approval. Um, so all of these rights are subject to quite a long list of prior approval matters. So it can be highways impacts, flooding, contamination impact on um, neighbour amenity, overlooking, privacy, external appearance of the building. And that list has sort of been, you know, becoming quite long and has led people to say, well, this is all looking rather like um, a, an application for planning permission, aren't I better off going for that? Um, and I think there is some truth in that, but I think it is worth pointing out that it does, you know, the, the general thrust um, of what the government is trying to achieve is a much more streamlined list um, of issues that the local authority can have regard to when they're looking at applications for these types of development. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I think it's worth pointing out that with the use classes order, um, notwithstanding you know, the fact that we've got this legal challenge on the horizon and that's still uh, waiting to um, play itself out, um, there are definitely some big opportunities that um, are to be had around that, regardless of whether there are conditions that limit certain things and the local authorities are still going to be trying to impose them um, or rely on existing policy. You know, that essentially, the only way that this can go um, in view of the government's relaxation on the, in the use classes order is that there must be more relaxation in terms of changing, changing use, all good news for the high street, and the same for the PD rights. There are benefits there. They are complicated pieces of legislation to pick your way through, but definitely some opportunities for those that are willing to do that. So now that I've blinded you with science, or uh, well, more specifically, some of the legislative changes, I'm going to hand back to Helen and the other speakers who are going to talk about the implications of these changes in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mita. My goodness me, when you see them listed, they're very complicated. Now, just to reassure everyone, the um, slides will be available shortly. The video will be up on the website and we'll let you know when it's ready and up there. And one other thing I've just thought about with the um, Mita's presentation is so detailed. When you've, at the end, when we have our Q&As, can you everyone ask general questions about the legislation as opposed to specific sites that you may think this is relevant to. Okay, so we're now going to hand over to um, Jerry Cassidy, who's the planning partner at BPTW. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Mita, for passing over the baton. Um, can I have my first slide, please? Fabulous, and the next one, please. Um, so my name is Jerry Cast. I'm the planning partner of BPTW Planning. We are um, architects and town planners and uh, our, our planning unit is quite independent from our architects. We have a unit of about 10, 12 at the moment. We are the guys you come to uh, in order to assist with planning applications or indeed uh, meet us prior approvals. Um, next slide, please. And the next one. And we're award winning, as you can see. <laughs> Next one. Okay, so um, what was what is the intent of the government? Well, as Mita has alluded to, back in 2000, Tony Blair's government launched its green paper delivering a fundamental change. And he complained at the time that the planning system was showing its age and we needed a better, simpler, faster, more accessible system. And then David Cameron had another crack at it in 2010, against bewailing the fact that it was too complicated. Theresa May gave it a go in 2017 to remember to fix the broken housing market. And of course, um, Mr Johnson has now declared the biggest shake-up of the planning system since the war. However, at its most basic, the intent of the government has been to allow flexibility for developers and landowners to 
to get on with the business of building new homes and also to reduce the number of long term voids on the high street. Unsurprisingly, the councils as planning authorities have had a few concerns where these aims are to be resolved on the high street. For instance, the diversity of the high street could be eroded. As you've widened this new use class E um, with smaller or less regulatory control, restaurants may fare better than, say, record shops, leading to um, an amalgamation of just one or two uses. The permitted development rights um, impact perhaps on housing quality for the there has been some analysis done that for the uh, new flats that have created under PD rights in London at least 60% of them are under the minimum national standards if you were to apply for full planning permission. There's also concern, as said before, about the loss of critical mass itself, the number of commercial properties needed to support the, the vitality of these historic retail clusters. And of course, probably at the, the, the root of this, permitted development cuts out the political process and locals and communities themselves have, have limited impact uh, to, or input to comment on the proposals. All this comes within a wider context of planning reform. There is now a push towards a zonal planning system rather than one based on policy and planning judgment. And this hasn't gone down well with the Tory heartland with the very idea that politicians or local communities will be replaced by a purely regulatory system, much like building control has led to a back backbencher um, revolt. On top of all of this, we've got the pandemic, the rise of online retailing um, and the sable rattering, as Mita had said, on the high court challenges means that predicting the future of the high stream is extremely difficult for commentators like myself. I suppose if I had to make the prediction, it would be that these changes will not become evident overnight. There are definitely gains to be had from landowners and businesses, but ultimately these changes will come from naked market forces more than just tinkering with the, the, the regulatory planning system. Next slide, please. The best thing about this new use class, again, as Mita has said, is it cuts out local authority uh, uh, from the, the planning decision making whatsoever, provided that you're eligible. So planning policy is all about setting a clear set of guidelines when determining a planning application. Therefore, the council can only impact on all the other stuff when it does come within their control. So with respect to moving between the range of uses within the new class, use class C, e, I'm not aware of any local authorities trying to limit this through other means. But attention has been focused on the ability to convert from Class E to residential uses and talk about um, special controls, special Article 4 directions, etc. And Meta has already pointed out the importance of looking at the historical planning res restrictions on, on your own uh, properties if you wish to take advantage of this new use Class E. Meta has always point, pointed out that this does not give permitted development rights for associated works. So such as bricking up a large display window or advertisements may still need to be the subject of planning application. Although a bit of a grey area, generally speaking, the amalgamation of the units does nor normally require planning permission, but subdivision does. So again, that may come under some, some planning control. Um, and just a word about new planning applications that seek to incorporate an element of use class. Again, Meet has touched on this. Often the local authority will want to test the worst case scenario. So it's good news, this new use class for existing properties, but when you're applying for a, a brand new new build planning application, class E will be assessed in a worst case scenario. That's the most extreme or broadest range. So for instance, testing whether or not residential above a late night gym um, is, is viable. Many cases, because the number of reports needed to support all these new 
um, the broader range of worst case scenarios, many times it's easier just to seek to limit the extent of use classes through through the, the application of planning conditions, for instance. In other words, applying to say, not that you wish use class on the, the uh, E on the ground floor, that you would be quite happy with say, uh, an office or a, a pure retail function rather than a, a, a late night gym as, as an extreme example. Next slide, please. Um, where the planning authority does retain an element of control for physical works, I suspect there's going to be a greater emphasis placed on how these units look. The old use classes, I think, had a certain inherent aesthetic. A shop looks like a shop, a solicitor's or a restaurant look like one of them. So where the council does have control, and remember we talked about those associated works to support the change in use class, then place making, heritage, making a, a, a maintaining a visual vibrancy is going to become more important. And I think also the implication may well be that um, if there is a, a, a loss of retail um, to, to convert into residential, then where will this new stock come from? And one response may be that the councils will ask future developments, future planning applications to resupply the stock that they may be perceived to be draining away from the town centres. I think I'll just, just go on to the next slide, please. So, um, Meet has also um, uh, spoke about uh, this new, uh, new use class MA. This is the one that allows conversion through permit, um, through prior approval process from um, high high street uses to residential. Um, many London boroughs have already Article Four directions prohibiting the conversion to residential. This means that it's restricting your permitted development rights. Now these, um, most of these will cease to apply in August 2022, unless they're reintroduced. Uh, to reflect this new use class MA. We know that Lewisham has no plans to do it as, as, as does Sutton. Greenwich and Bexley, um, they remain undecided or they might be very, very focused. But the government's made it quite clear that it will not take kindly to blanket Article 4 directions reducing the ability to convert from town centre uses to uh, to residential in a, across the whole of the borough. It has to be evidenced and it has to be targeted. Um, just if I can go to the next slide there. I was asked to, to, to look specifically at the, um, the rights to upward extensions. And I'm probably just going to echo some of uh, what Mita was talking about. But just take, let's take a, a case study on uh, the screen at the moment. So this is an example in North London of a terrace property with some financial services at the ground uh, floor and residential above. And the council agreed that the proposal was eligible to be considered under the prior approval process. It ticked all the, the relevant pro, uh, process. That meant that you now need to submit a prior approval application. And the council can lawfully consider a number of things, probably more than, the, than, than um, you would normally consider in a purely regulatory um, process. For instance, um, neighbour consultation. In, in this case, there was, there was no objections to the council's formal process. Parking in highways, contamination and flooding risk. The case officers' colleagues in the council were happy with this. The adequacy of natural light into the new units. Um, those, 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 those were fine. The impact on neighbouring homes, overlook, privacy, loss of light. Again, the council had no concerns. The impact of noise um, on these two new residential units above uh, from the surrounding commercial premises, all acceptable. Um, even the, uh, the addition of bin stores under necessary work, these were all fine and they all met minimum national size standards. These are all um, valid assessments that the council will make for your prior approval. 
what happens, which tends not to be appreciated, is that the external appearance of the building will also be assessed by the council. So don't approach a prior approval um, to, to confirm your permitted development rights for residential developments as a black and white regulatory process. In this case, the council felt that an additional story, especially on the end of a terrace, would look out of place. And that's all they needed in order to justify um, a refusal of the prior approval and consideration that this in fact did not um, a, a amount to permitted development. And if they wished to, to, to resolve it, they would need to put in a full fat planning application. So as, as, as Mita alluded to earlier, I think we need to look at these um, type of prior approval applications as mini planning applications. But also importantly, they also establish a new baseline position. In other words, you can say to the council, it is possible for us to get an extra story without the need for planning permission. So why don't we have a sensible conversation and do it properly so that if we submit for a full planning application, we actually don't get a absolute blank response from them, a negative response on the basis that they know that you can get a prior approval for some other baseline position. So I'm going to hand back to Helen. Hopefully that was within time and um, pass the baton. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was fascinating, thank you. We're now going to go on to Edward Dent, who's Head of Land and Residential Development at Hindwoods. Over to you, Ed. Hi there, um, I'm Ed Dent. My responsibilities at Hindwoods are for land and development. And um, I'm just gonna give us sort of more of a market approach um, to give a flavour of some of the practical implications and effects of the government reforms that some of uh, the other speakers have been describing. And um, I would just point out that, um, if you could click on a slide, please. We're fundamentally a South East London, South London based and Kent company. Um, and uh, so my perspective is quite a local one, so I can't speak of national impacts. Good, next slide, please. Click on okay, and another one. Yeah, um, we've got. Um, although I'm in the land and development department, we have got a big management department, um, and also we do professional work. So I'm quite well positioned, uh, as I do sometimes speak to my colleagues to, um, you know, give give some ideas of impact that they've had as well from from landlords and and also tenants. Um, if you click on one more slide, please. We have a, a lot of larger clients, uh, but we also represent a lot of smaller ones, investors, developers. And um, uh, I'd just like to say that you know, from now on, uh, my plan is first to talk about business development um, and then to move on to changes in the use class order. Um, but as this is all fairly new, um, some of the observations are, are going to be factual, some anecdotal, and some probably apocryphal, but I'll leave you to decide uh, which one's which. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Some of these points will have been covered um, already, so uh, as we are pressed for time, I'll, I'll whiz on. Um, but I just want to look at the general background um, of the intention, um, which is really to rehabilitate empty space and commercial premises and bring them back into beneficial use. Um, and also help with the housing targets which successive governments have been failing to uh, meet and blame other people for. Um, also, as we said, simplification of the planning process, speed of delivery, protection of the old sacred cow of the green belt, which you know, we can't go there to, to develop, all sort of uh, seem to be um, green lights. And obviously, initially, this was received very well by the property industry. Um, as a windfall really for landowners and developers and the ability to, to get on and buy and develop properties quite quickly and with less uh, constraints than they'd normally, normally face. If you can put the next slide on, please. Got some of these figures just to see how much of an impact um, this had in the first five years or so. So you can see from there, these are government statistics um, but it did make a reasonably significant impact, so an additional 7% uh, 
to the net housing stock every year, um, averaging out about six and a half. Um, and you can see that uh, one of the uh, government ministers there, who's very much signed up to permitted development, is a really useful uh, extra um, sort of uh, weapon in the government's armament to try to boost the housing targets. He describes them quite often as houses, um, which if somebody's uh, seen some of the permitted development <laughs> flats which have been created, you might argue with. Uh, but otherwise, it makes the stats certainly look a lot better. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Jerry, I know, has covered some of these um, points, but generally speaking, it did attract a, there's a bit of a gold rush for some of the first buildings, and it did attract some of the less scrupulous um, landlords and investors for development. Uh, the building at the top here has, I think, 500 units in it, some are 13 square metres. Um, and a lot of these were would have been uh, for, on the rental basis and would have been for with people who were um, from local authority uh, tenants lists. So immediately there are people, it's a monocultural unit and they suddenly had very big problems with crime, bad health um, and all sorts of issues. Um, so this has led to the, the whole PD regime having a, a bit of a bad reputation and has deterred some developers from really wanting to get involved with it. Um, Similarly, the other unit down in the bottom right-hand corner, they initially applied for 15 units in there, um, seven of which didn't have any natural daylight. Um, so you can see why uh, the, some of them did have a bad rep. Um, similarly, the whole regime sort of disenfranchised local communities to some extent, in as much as it went roughshod over local plans. There are no uh, payments or social housing had to prov be provided. Uh, for developments that came via this route. And, um, and also there's no sort of contributions for section 106s and so on. So um, yeah, yeah, if you can move on a bit, please, the next slide. The government's obviously decided to use these two um, weapons of permitted development and the change of the use class orders specifically to um, redesign and revivify, revitalize, which is the word you want, the, the high street. Um, in their new document, which was published in July of this year, um, they specifically mentioned these two um, and they describe it as clearing away red tape. Um, now we know this is, it's hard not to uh, bring in politics when you're talking about housing. Um, and obviously there is a sort of narrative with certainly with the Conservatives that um, housing delivery has been stymied by the planning system and uh, bureaucracy, local authorities, and certainly uh, uh, they want to cut away as much of this as possible and facilitate development as they see it. Um, so this is what they're planning for the high street. Um, and this new plan here, if you want to read it, describes it um, in much more detail. But we all obviously know that the high streets were doing very badly and suffering a lot before COVID came along. And so all of these, this is nothing new, what's happened recently. Um, if you can uh, go on to the next slide, please. So the, uh, we know that the, it's a proven that um, the, this method adds new housing to stock. Um, but in order to um, try to address some of the criticisms of the previous uh, regime, uh, as, as has been described, they now have to adhere to more and more um, pre-qualifications, so room sizes, natural daylight, and so on. So in a way, that's a kind of tacit acceptance of the shortcomings of the former, um, the former sort of regime and that, that led to some inadequate properties being developed. Um, um, uh, ironically, um, this is sort of more bureaucracy, which is taking the permitted development more to be like a full planning application um, and therefore one feels that it's probably less attractive to developers. Um, one thing which permitted development has led to is this idea of establishing the principle of residential development. So for a property which normally wouldn't have a, wouldn't get permission to convert, developers are first of all going to get the permitted development for units which will be quite poor um, and then subsequently going back to the planners and saying, well, um, if you can now allow us to develop it in the way we would have done 
um, if we, uh, if we, as we'd like to, um, then we won't build these really inadequate units. So the political authorities are somehow st you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place of having to consent um, properties and developments which they normally wouldn't do because of this regime. So there's a, they're just adding to the tension really between central and local government. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. It remains to be seen with the um, with the change of use whether whether that will add now a lot more units. Um, as a lot of people think that the low hanging fruit has been actually picked, the big office buildings which lend themselves easily to be developed um, have already gone. Some of the big new uh, commercial units, say big shopping centres, are not easy to actually develop with deep floor plates into residential space. Um, and similarly, user class orders. Um, yeah, they, that also has its own problems. Retail uh, units here, um, long and thin generally with a small shop front, are not easy to convert into residential. Um, and obviously there's other, that leads to other sort of knock-on effects uh, on the high street, um, such as, for example, living above shops, uh, deliveries, noisy deliveries in the morning, um, let me just have a look. Um, commercial uh, residential values of shops. If you're living above an office and suddenly it becomes a restaurant, that can quite have a quite a hefty impact on the value of your accommodation. So there are um, there are sort of uh, unseen uh, consequences for these uh, use class orders, which are fairly broad brushstroke ones. If you move on, please. COVID's just acted as a massive accelerant um, and uh, catalyst on the high street for all that was going forward. Obviously, uh, the government's uh, given out financial support for tenants and protected them from eviction and so on. Um, and this has meant that uh, we're living in a sort of strange world where we don't really know what the impact has uh, the, the, that's been felt on the high street is, because a lot of shops are still empty. Um, but there's no possibility of evicting the tenants, even if they want to, landlords. Um, and this moratorium is extended till next year, um, till end of March, I believe. So there's a certain continued uncertainty of the impact of this and any new changes. And I think Jerry said that it's going to be some time before all this comes out in the wash and we see really what the local high streets look like. Um, you, uh, put the next slide on, please. Um, just to come back to the initial focus, it's obviously no one has a crystal ball, otherwise we'd be sitting on our yachts um, rather than uh, here. Um, but some of the things that we've seen locally are that landlords who are willing to talk to tenants um, are the ones that are doing better on the high street at the moment. The old fashioned landlord and tenant relationship of 20 year leases and five year upward owner reviews is probably something of the past. Um, and tenant landlords are going to have to risk share with tenants more if things like COVID come along or other economic or other impacts. Similarly, the high street itself will change in the mix of businesses which are able to compete there successfully. Um, there'll probably be more destinations and leisure areas with some retail offers there than just straightforward uh, retail destinations where people are going to buy their shopping because shopping patterns have changed so drastically over the past few years. Um, similarly, probably more successful in affluent areas, uh, we can see still being successful in the high street and we're still letting shops at good rents and there's a lot of demand with, where there's less um, decent, less disposable income than in uh, rural areas, then some of those high streets are probably uh, lost forever, if not on the last legs, to be honest. Um, I think all we can say with regard to the future is if you've got a decent high street at the moment and you like going there, make the most of it while it's uh, while it's still there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. And our final speaker is Yildiz Betes, who's partner and head of real estate at Thackeray Williams. And I also have the pleasure of sitting on the South East London Chamber board with Yildiz. So over to you. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Bring up my slides. So obviously, um, Helen's just said I'm head of real estate at Thackeray Williams, which covers both commercial property and land development. Thackeray Williams is a full service law firm based with our headquarters in Bromley, but also offices in Seven Oaks and the city. 
A lot of our property clients are eyeing up the new legislation, especially the change in the use classes and the expanded um, permitted development rights. So I'm going to talk about the issues around property law, which are very different to the planning aspects. I mean, property development can be a profitable business, but even the most seasoned of our property developers can get tripped up if we neglect the basics of property law. So whether this is the first development or 51st, the same basic principles will apply. So next slide, please, Mike. So the three basic things you need to look at at the very outset is title, access and services. With regards to title, you need to make sure you've been given a clear plan showing the extent of the land in the buildings that you're buying. You need to ensure that what you're relying on in terms of making your offer has been checked against the seller's title. In order to be sure, I'll often ask for an accurate site plan so I can do a search at the land registry for our clients to make sure it does fall within the seller's title. I also ask to look at the register because the clients need to be aware of any restrictive covenants or third party rights in the title which could interfere with or even thwart a development. This is very much a se separate issue to planning. The grant of a planning permission does not overcome any title issues. If there are third party rights, more often than not, you can't interfere with those and your development needs to be designed around those rights. And there could also be restrictive covenants on the title, which are effectively negative covenants that say what can and cannot be done with the land. For example, it might dictate only commercial buildings can be built or residential, or it might restrict the size and the height of the development. Depending on the covenant, its age and whether it's known who has the benefits of it, you may be able to insure it by indemnity insurance. However, the insurers will assess the likelihood of a claim being made. It may not always be available. Or it may not be the suitable solution. And then you might need to look to obtain a release of that covenant, which obviously could attract a cost. And um, you could also apply to the Lands Tribunal to possibly discharge or modify that covenant. The other aspect is access. It's important to check that access to development can be obtained for either, from either an adopted highway or across third party land. You can't assume that just because the land is adjacent to a road that access is available. There may be a small gap between the land that you're buying and the adopted highway. This could be a result of a historical, an error on a historical plan, but it could also be what is called a ransom strip. This is where a third party has retained a piece of land in the expectation that that land will be developed and will be able to demand a premium in exchange for access rights. If you're buying part of a larger site, then you need to check with the seller that they're going to grant you sufficient rights to access the retained land. If there are no access rights, then you might need a separate deed of easement, which would also incur a cost. With regards to services, you need to check the site benefits from main connections, sorry, connections to main services. Are there any existing sewers or other pipes um, under the site that might affect the ability to build over them? An inspection of the title and utility searches may assist, but again, you might not be able to connect to main services and may need a deed of easement, which will incur a cost. So these are some of the very basic principal considerations when it comes to property development. Each site will have individual issues and will require bespoke review. However, it's important to appreciate that any misunderstanding of these issues could be the difference between making a profit or making a loss. Next slide, please, Mike. So I wanted to talk about rooftop developments, in particular over existing blocks of flats. One of the types of development that ought to become easier from a planning perspective is the construction of the additional flats, which I now doubt, having listened to every, everybody else on the panel today. Research has already shown that up to 40,000 new homes could be built in zones one and two alone, simply by building up. Despite this, there are a range of obstacles in the way of a developer from a property law perspective. First of all, you'd need to look at the existing leases and the rights of the tenants in those existing leases. First question is, who actually owns the roof and the airspace? This may be an obvious question, but the answer is not always that obvious. The starting place is usually the lease of the flats occupying the current top floor of the building. In a block of flats, one would expect the roof to be retained by the landlord. It's a general rule that a freehold owner of the land is presumed to own the airspace above it too. A developer would also need to check whether there are any easements over the roof void that would interfere with the development. For example, in some buildings, the hot water tanks, television aerials, satellite equipment, etc., may be in the roof void, and the tenants may have rights over the roof void for these 
items. If that's the case, then you'd need to agree a deed of variation with all the roof tenants, and that can only be done with the actual agreement. The other issue which isn't so obvious is whether the development will breach the covenant to repair the roof. Where the roof is retained by the landlord, it's likely that he will have covenanted to maintain or repair the roof. In Devonshire Reed Properties Treadman in 1997, it was held that the construction of a fifth flat on the roof of the building would put the landlord in breach of its obligation to repair the roof because the covenant to repair it was a duty not to destroy it. So pulling it down wholly or partly was a breach of that covenant. That decision was not followed in Hannon and 169 Queensgate Limited in 2000. However, whether there's an implied duty not to destroy must depend on the construction of the lease and not every alteration of the premises amounts to a breach of the covenant to repair. So as you can see, the terms of existing leases of the building may conflict with the proposed redevelopment. In extreme cases, the top floor mat flat may have the roof and airspace in its demise. A well-advised landlord would expressly exclude the roof and the airspace from any demise. It's also common for residential leases to contain a covenant by the landlord that every lease will contain the same provisions together with a mutual enforceability covenant requiring the landlord to enforce the tenant covenants if asked to do so. This may give rise problems when the landlord wishes to grant a lease of the roof space so that an additional flat or a larger flat can be built. As most leases will have a prohibition against structural alterations. In the case of Duval and 11 to 13 Randolph Crescent Limited in 2020, the Supreme Court held that the landlord could be in breach of the mutual forcibility covenant if it permitted a tenant to carry out works that would otherwise be in breach of the absolute prohibition on carrying out structural alterations. You also need to look at the service charge provisions. More often than not, when the block is first built, the leases specify the proportion for each flat in terms of the service charge. So for example, if five flats are built, each are liable to pay uh, one fifth. Clearly, if that's the case and additional flats are built, then those leases are gonna to need to be varied. And that again can only be done with the agreement of the tenants. And then there's the landlord's quiet enjoyment clause, which is likely to be included with any existing lease of the building and will be implied in any event. And this may be breached by the landlord's proposed development if the construction works materially interfere with the tenant's possession and enjoyment of the property. Even a well-drafted lease, the lease that reserves rights to redevelop, is unlikely to be sufficient to overcome claims of breaches of quiet enjoyment by the existing tenants, where the interference caused by the construction is significant, and particularly where the works are wholly for the benefit of the landlord and where the landlord is acting unreasonably. And again, we need to come back to the freehold title and those restrictive covenants. There may be covenants that prohibit the number of stories that can be built. Obviously, we'd look into indemnity insurance again, and if that's not available, whether we can secure a release or possibly a discharge or modify the covenant of the Lands Tribunal. We also need to look at the statutory rights of tenants, and most importantly, the rights of first refusal. If the landlord is going to dispose of the rooftop on a development lease, it must give serious consideration as to whether that disposal will be a relevant disposal within the Landlord and Tenant Act 1987. If so, then it must give the right of first refusal to the existing tenants. This is a really tricky area of law and fraught with technical difficulties that we have a whole department that specialises in this area of law and which advises our developers. And a disposal also includes an option in any contract, any agreement for lease. And what happens if the landlord fails to comply with the Act? Well, the landlord is then guilty of a criminal offence if they make a relevant disposal without, without having first complied with the requirements of right of first, sorry, right of first refusal. The offence is punishable by an unlimited fine. Where the landlord is a company, any officer who consents or causes the same by their neglect is separately guilty of the same offence. The landlord's guilt has no effect whatever on the validity of his disposal. However, the tenants have a separate right against the purchaser to force the purchaser to sell the property to them on the same terms. So the purchaser will be just as concerned that the act has been complied with. The other issue is collective enfranchisement. The leasehold urban housing and sorry, the leasehold reform housing and urban development act 1993 allows leaseholders to compulsory purchase the freehold of the block and thereby deprive the landlord of his asset altogether. The price to be paid for, paid for the block is determined by evaluation exercise prescribed by the 1993 act. As is commonly the case of statutory valuations, the exercise is to be undertaken with reference to open market sale with certain assumptions. 
If the tenants intend to collectively end franchise, then it's more than likely to bring the development plans to an end for the landlord and turn it into an argument about development value. This will usually be a matter of valuation evidence before first tier tribunal. In the absence of any solid evidence about the validity of the proposed scheme, it's much easier for the tenants to argue that the prospect of development is remote and warrants only a nominal payment in compensation to the landlord, if indeed anything. And lastly, the other third party rights we need to think about are rights of light. Upward urban development is more likely to infringe rights of light enjoyed by adjoining properties. A developer will need to assess potentially impacted rights of light and could face a lengthy, costly legal battle or have to incur the cost of settling potential claims. Indemnity insurance may be available to cover the risk of rights of light's claim. A right to light is the right of a building owner occupier to receive direct light through windows in the building. It attaches to the buildings and not to the land. A right to light may be extinguished by agreement, which requires a release in writing, unity of ownership where two freeholds are united, abandonment, but well, that's quite difficult to prove, and it can be overridden by a compulsory purchase order. A reduction in light does not automatically lead to a claim. There must be such a deprivation of light as to render the occupation of the land uncomfortable in accordance with the ordinary ideas of mankind as set out in Coles and Home Colonial Stores in 1904. A specialist surveyor should be instructed to produce a report on the impact of the right of light and create what is called a development envelope, which sets out the dimensions that the development should keep to so that any breaches of rights of light are eliminated or at least minimized. If a development goes ahead and, as, and does actually interfere with neighboring rights of light, the court may order damages or may order injunctive relief preventing the development starting or even requiring it to be taken down altogether. So hopefully I've given you a taste of the potential pitfalls of rooftop developments, even if planning is obtained. They're not impossible, but they're difficult. And rooftop developments are much easier to carry out with the cooperation of existing tenants, but that won't always be possible. Often the owners of the existing top floor flat will not want the development above them and will do everything they can to prevent it. The developers that I've seen do this successfully have positively engaged with the tenants, gained their trust and cooperation, and have sweetened the deal by giving them, um, well, you know, by making general improvements to the building, to the commuter parks, even installing a lift. Um, so that's the way of dealing with the actual tenants. So um, now back to you, Helen. Um, any questions from for the panel? Thank you very much. My goodness. Um, Mike, can we, are we, we can see everyone? Excellent. Well, that's absolutely fascinating, guys. Um, do we have any questions? Anyone want to put a little electronic hand up? Well, while everyone's thinking, I've got one I want to ask yield it. I'm going to jump in here. Um, is, actually, is there an ideal size for a block of flats, if, you know, if you want to do a roof, rooftop development? Yeah, well, I, you know, because I've said it's so much easier to the cooperation of the tenants, yep. really yep. the smaller the block, the better. Right. You know, I, I had one client come to me saying that there were like 50, four blocks of 50 tenants. And I, you know, that would have been a PR nightmare to coordinate that number of tenants. So yep. basically the smaller, the better. Right. Thank you. But, but yes. And that, that, that kind of reflects my um, experience as well, which is why this type of development is also quite attractive to housing associations. Yes. Can, can we ask, have you had people, of, of, you know, housing associations approach you, Jerry? Yes, they're very interested um, from the, the traditional in full developments on their own on their own estates yeah. to actually utilising this airspace. Um, and uh, unfortunately, PD has had a bad right. It's had a bad press in that substandard, etc. So local. Um, um, housing associations haven't quite got up to speed with this, but there definitely is huge potential where they can properly manage the tenants. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Thank you. Do I see? Oh, I can see Paul Russell. 
then yes hello um, yeah. this is this is for um for jerry hi jerry um the the example of the the north london um project with the floors being added it sort of seems that the only reason why it might have been refused planning in the first place um, was because of the effect of massing by putting two floors on. So the, the, the PD process doesn't actually remove that obstacle. And if you look at, you know, I've been asked to look at the number, we've got one through in, in Southwark without too much trouble, but surely the intention of the legislation is to give a presumption in favour of adding two floors and surely it must be seen that quite often that will give rise to unequal massing shall we say yes i mean that's that that that's how it pans out um it may though that not be there may be other elements as well um that aren't properly asset that wouldn't be assessed if um it was in a prior approval so um i'm thinking possibly of also um accessibility issues for instance um or um perhaps the the requirement for um a uh, disabled space for instance on the, the front court um or indeed if there was a requirement to pay um section 106 um contributions for instance it should be made, made clear though that um still uh, you're still so liable because you're creating that extra floor space but you're absolutely right i think that's why both me and myself have, have suggested certainly commentators have said that um you should approach these as mini planning applications um uh, where the principle of development has already been established and you're essentially trying to demonstrate why it shouldn't be approved so following on from that what 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 general approach have you found from, for instance, Greenwich and, and Lewisham to adding two floors to blocks? Do you have any um, it's, it's still early days. Still early days, so I, I wouldn't like to. I, I wouldn't like to speculate without without the evidence. However, um, almost certainly, this has come at a time where design elements. Um, within local authorities and design expertise has actually in, um, in been increased and bolstered. So um, I think the message is, and you're getting yourself, Paul, is that it's a, um, it's all it's as much a design-led project process and qu quant uh, qualitative kind of assessment as it is as just ticking the box. Um, I suspect it's also to do with um, a contextual. So yeah. Greenwich, for instance, has a has is a stronger heritage bent. However, Lewisham are more precious of what um, um heritage elements they actually have to protect. Um so I think it's horses for courses. I think I've dodged a question, Paul. <laughs> yes, that's fine. So just one little point, just for, for general information, just if you are trying to do add floors in Greenwich. There's a not rather sneaky little clause round, right down the bottom, which says you can't add the floors if you're in three kilometres of an airport. And London City Airport is very inconveniently located. Uh, I, I wonder whether or not that's, whether or not you, not it, it's the assessment criteria. Mm -hmm. um, you're definitely right, Paul, that that is one of the, the list of criteria, along with flooding, everything else, contamination, that, that need, needs to be assessed. Um, but I'm not sure whether or not that's a complete moratorium. I believe it is. I, I had um, I, I put in for one in Greenwich um, and having lost sight of that, and they basically said, no, you don't qualify because you're within three kilometres. Thank you, Paul. I do feel because we are that's running fine. out. Sorry. Um, it's all right, it's all right, because I saw um, Peter George go contaminated. Yes, uh, good afternoon all. Um, we, um, because of the nature of our work, contaminated land and flood risk, um, we get involved in ordinary planning, discharge of planning conditions and for um, permitted development. Um, so I've got 
uh, two questions. One that just occurred to me just in the middle of the event, and that is, does the requirement to consult, consult on pre-start conditions apply to permitted development in the same way as it does to uh, planning application? And the other thing was just to, to ask what people's experience was, is how, bearing in mind that some of our conditions can take a long, long time to discharge, um, how much quicker is it to to get something um, through the permitted development process than um, the traditional planning application? Um, well, I'm hoping Mita will will step in if I'm misdirecting. Um, but my understanding is you can apply planning conditions, and indeed, um, prior approvals can also attract. Um, planning agreements as well, section 106. So it's not beyond the, the bounds of possibility that there will be pre-start conditions as well. So I'm thinking of things like, for instance, parking um, requirements or further um, uh, contamination reports, for instance. Um, but, um, Ita? Uh, no, I'm... <clears throat> I don't have anything to add. I think that's absolutely right. If um, provided you are limiting yourself, uh, the local authority is limiting itself to matters relating to prior approval matters, then yes, is the answer. As far as the timescales go, now you're pushing me here. Um, there are a number of prior approvals that um, enjoy um, deemed um, um, approval. In other words, if the, the the council doesn't respond within, I think it's eight weeks, um, then you may be able to enjoy a deemed approval. In other words, they haven't said anything, therefore you have permitted you have permitted development rights. There are there are some things you need to check about that, but that's 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 the way it goes. However, you can extend the um, the the period of determination with agreement from the council. And there are there are reasons why you would wish to do that. Many times the local authority does not have the resources or the internal responses back to um, to to respond um, confidently. Say, for instance, in flooding issues, for instance, and therefore they may take the um, the. Um, path of least resistance and actually refuse your prior approval on the basis it's the, the safest course. So um, eight weeks is the, the kind of statutory time, but almost certainly it takes longer. Um, it really depends on the, the resources of the council and of course how, how, how complex the analysis is. If I can just add to that, in relation to the PD rights that we were talking about, there is no provision for a deemed approval. So at the end of eight weeks, what you get is a right of appeal for non-determination if you haven't extended that time period by agreement with the local authority. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one very quick question. Are there any, any hands up? Is that a no? Well, I'm going to chuck one at Ed, uh, and this is a really, give me a really quick answer on this, Ed. Um, so is the high street already a thing of the past? And should we just really recognize that and move on? Uh, yeah, thanks for that one. <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the high street as we knew it probably 10 years ago is a thing of the past because the habits have changed so much because the ownership of businesses, the nature of businesses, the way people, the goods and services they want there have really evolved at a really amazing rate, which has been um, accelerated, as I say, by COVID. So what it will look like in three, four, five years, I'm not sure. You know, we've got dark convenience stores where um, shops are now no longer open to the public. Um, but you know, they will deliver you your bag of crisps and your uh, in up to in 10 to 20 minutes. Um, there's a lot of click and collect going on, so people are not actually going into shops, they're just mm. taking stuff out of the window uh, mm. that happens to be on the high street. And you know, thrown into that mix, we might have blocks of flats, which, as Jerry said earlier on, um, you know, that might reduce the critical mass of some high streets and actually be the death knell for places which could bounce mm. back. You know, there's a lot mm. of young. Um, 
there's a lot of entrepreneurs, young people who want to set up their own businesses using perhaps government grants and so on. But it's very hard for them to find premises at the moment, and they're being eaten up as a, as a rate. You know, there's a piece of research came out yesterday showing London boroughs with growing populations, such as Tower Hamlets, where there's going to be a massive under-provision of retail space um, in the next few years, and it's seen as possibly an opportunity for developers, which is counterintuitive yeah. considering the conversation we're having. Thank you very much. So it really is, isn't it? it it's watch this space, and um, we'll all keep up to date with things. And as I said earlier, I, I think we'll, we'll let everyone know when the, when the video goes up and I'd just like to thank um, the panel today and everyone who's attended and I hope you've enjoyed a very stimulating hour and a quarter. So thank you everyone and thank you to Think Events and the team there. Mike's been doing the beautiful slides. Well done Mike and thank you Jimmy. <laughs>